And today, we share an excerpt from that extraordinary interview. Intuition. What is it? Intuition is the only way to arrive at truth, uh, even when rational concepts or intellectual capacities fail. Because you can rationalize, to, to, uh, bring it into, uh, into rational terms, only what is not absolutely unique. But if you are confronted with a phenomenon which is unique, which never will recur, which only once appears and confronts you, you have to resort to intuition. Because intuition can handle the unique things that only once and only here and now are confronting you. For instance, in moral, on the moral level, what takes over intuitive means is our conscience. Conscience is not just the superego as the, the superego being the interjected father image as far as Sigmund Freud taught us. Conscience is more than the outcome of some conditioning processes as the, as the behaviorists uh, try to persuade you. Conscience is that organon built in, in the human condition, in la condition humaine, which can get hold of unique things, unique offers of a meaning potentiality to be actualized. You sound like Kant. I congratulate you because it's absolutely right and pertinent, your remark. It is 50% of Kant's teaching. Yes, And there are course. few people in the world throughout history who really could <laughs> digest it. And, <laughs> well, I, didn't, I don't think I digested it, but it surely <laughs> impacted me. Maybe that was the reason. Yeah. Maybe you that's must have digested it because it has nourished you, uh, apparently. Yeah. And it's probably set the soil that on a subconscious level made me hear what you were saying mm -hmm. and receive what you were teaching and be responsive. Oh, this is interesting. You see, there's a great danger. Scientists are often reductionists. That is, they try to reduce the great human phenomena to, into, uh, to, to something lower, to something that you find also on the uh, subhuman level. If people say, you may find everything actually also in animals, whatever human being can develop and uh, on a mature level, uh, conscience and love and so forth. This is not true. This reminds me of the story of two Jewish people who were struggling and fighting one another. The one had, uh, had uh, contended, the other's cat had eaten up four pounds of his butter. And then they went to the rabbi for a Solomonic uh, judgment. And the rabbi said, now, uh, how many pounds of butter? Four pounds of butter. He ordered, bring me scales, and the broad scales. And then he put the, uh, the cat on the scales, and it weighed four pounds. The cat, or the weight of the cat was four pounds. Then the rabbi said, now I have the butter, but where is the cat? <laughs> you see, now they find, of course, the pseudo-human properties in animals, but then they have to ask, where is man? The picture of the, of the humanism man had got lost, you see? This is reductionism. Reductionism preaching that, that uh, love is nothing but sublimated sex. Love, love is intrinsically more. On the, Freud distinguished and uh, in, in, among the sexual drive, the sex instinct, distinguished between a goal and an object. The goal is getting rid, just getting rid of the tension of, uh, of uh, sexual tensions. And the object is the partner. Now a partner on the human level is never an object, must never be used as an object, never be used as a means to an end. This is Immanuel Kant's second version of the categorical imperative. A human being must never be used merely as a means to an end. And so only on the human, only on the human level you reach the 
the, that stage where the partner has been recognized and acknowledged as a human subject, not an object to just to, just to be used. But one step farther, one step higher, love is starting. Because in love, you not only recognize the humanness of your partner, but also the uniqueness of his or of him or of her. That is to say, only a loving person is capable of getting hold of the unique core of that other person uh, who uh, for, uh, represents his love partner. I said, somebody said to me, well, if God is God, why doesn't he let us see him? I quoted this from the Old Testament. I said, well, the Old Testament says that no man shall see God and live. If we really were as humans in our brains capable of seeing God in a scientific reality a type of an experience, we'd die of a heart attack. <laughs> there are transformers out here that have to cut the electric power down before it finally gets to a light bulb or the light bulb would just explode. Yeah. I think the, the energy level, the excitement level would be more than this organism. But biologically also, can handle. We would also be robbed of our freedom of decision to s decide exactly. in favor or against exactly. God. Exactly. Uh, if I wonderful. had the guarantee, religion would turn out into something, oh. would uh, be turned into something, a, a yes. say, what is it, insurance. Uh, That's right. It would insurance. Not be... Yes, uh, if I believe, then it will, it will, I will be happy in heaven. Sure. You see? You know what but the... so I, without any, uh, any force, only without being rationally forced, I have emotionally, let me say existentially, to plead for God rather yeah. against Him. Only if God, well, if proof is possible, then faith is impossible. Right, right. I once said in one of my books, uh, uh, God's existence cannot be proved as is the case, for instance, if we discover some, some traces of an animal, you see, right. in, in, uh, in, in, in term or what is it, uh, car, uh, in, in form of geological yes. uh, ge fossils. Uh, fo yeah. fossils. Then, yeah, fossils. fossils. God is not a, a died out uh, then, fossil no. that we can, whose traces we may discover and then say we have a proof there, but God is, uh, is more than a fossil. Absolutely. Hmm? Uh, Tell me, is a true, are there true materialists and secularists? And if they really are what they pretend to be, are they not less than a whole, true human being? To my personal conviction, according to my only persuasion, I would say they are not consciously, but unconsciously, they still uh, harbor, they still retain a directedness toward what you called transcendence. But not, uh, I must, as a medical prof a professional, as a psychiatrist uh, whose clientele had, ever, has, had always been a, a representation of religiously oriented and atheistically or agnostically oriented patients. I have to be strictly neutral. I am never allowed, in contrast to, a, 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 to you, you, for instance, never allowed, as it were, in extreme cases, to impose Your my Weltanschauung to anyone else. That's, they, why, that's why I became a minister and not a psychiatrist. Yeah. I thought about, in my college days, maybe I should become a psychologist and psychiatrist. But I really felt, Dr. Frankel, that there are some human predicaments that are caused by the value system. And if I couldn't, if I couldn't right. impose my value system right. into the therapeutic you situation... You the freedom to speak out your own convictions yes. and beliefs. In what I am. Which I'm not allowed to do. Not even in my, my publications. Right. Only in a few instances, I allowed explicitly myself to speak on the borderline of, uh, of, uh, the between theology and psychology. And then I make the uh, 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 preface remark that what I'm 
saying now through what the next eight pages, for instance, okay. is nothing that you have to subscribe in order to call yourself a logotherapist. I understand. So this you, is my private opinion or conviction. Uh, uh, very yeah. good. Very professional. But very there is an unconscious relationship to God, which I tried even empirically to reveal. You may in some dreams, by inter interpreting dreams of your patients, find that although on a conscious level they claim to be atheists, there are, there are uh, discoverable some, some longings in the direction to offer religion. Offer religion.